Hi there, good afternoon. It's very uh, great for me to um, just chair this brief session before we move back into our breakout rooms. Uh, let me introduce Gavin Boyle, CEO of Derby, Thomas, Deputy CEO of Plymouth, and Alan Foster, CEO of North Teens uh, and Hartlepool. Quite a challenge. Um, these, organize, these guys represent organisations who are on this crucial subgroup developing EPSIS for health. Um, EPSIS, what's the definition? Electronic Product Code Information Service, um, a GS1 standard enabling trading partners to share information about physical movement and status of products as they go through the supply chain, from business to business, and ultimately to consumers. So over lunch and a sandwich, we tried to translate that into healthcare uh, and what we came up with is better outcomes from big data. Uh, and I think the big question, having been set, Terence, right at the beginning, this challenge about narrow events, which acts as a kind of reflection, if you like, of what we're doing about patient safety generally, is you know, whether this work, does this have the potential to really, really make, make a difference? Now, I'm going to ask my um, colleagues to just say a little bit about how they think we can translate the work that is being done in this group back into their own organisation and also in systems because we're increasingly thinking about systems. Um, Alan, do you want to, do you mind going first? Not at all. Um, as I think has just been said, um, I said yesterday when I was on the panel, I'm passionate about this uh, in terms of what it can do for us what it can achieve. Um, we do put patients first in our organisation, and it's about making sure we get better outcomes for patients. Just thinking about the statistics that Glenn took us through from the OECD report there uh, earlier. If we get this wrong for patients, the overall numbers in the NHS might be small compared to the millions of people that we see day in, day out in primary care, acute care, community care, and wherever. But if we get something wrong for a patient, it's 100% wrong for them. It doesn't matter to them about the statistics. If we get it wrong, we get it wrong. And if it's wrong side surgery or medication that's done some harm, it's 100% wrong for them. And the thing for me to think about is, I'm getting older, as we all are, We've all probably used the health service in the past. We'll probably use it increasingly in the future. Therefore, those statistics could apply to us, any one of us in the room. It could apply to me. It could apply to you. It could apply to a member of your family. If we get it wrong, it's 100% wrong for that patient and the consequences for that family. And some of this is serious harm that we could and should avoid. So that's what it's about for me going forward. In my own organisation, we've been working with the other pilot organisations and we've got a certain degree of development going on between us. We've tried to work together and we need to cement that relationship going forward so that we can roll it out. But I've already seen the benefits uh, of what we're doing in, in North Tees and Hartlepool um, in terms of the, the nursing time that it's freeing up to better care for patients and making sure that we stop the line uh, and using the systems that we've got in terms of uh, scanning the product, scanning the patient, scanning the, the location in terms of the identifiers that we've got. Derby are one step ahead of us. We, we're up to the end of phase three. But it will make a massive difference. And the concept of moving it across the pathway, making sure that we don't just apply it in secondary care, in our acute hospitals, we applied in the community, we applied in primary care. We look at the benefits it could bring uh, right across the whole system. It is huge. And that's the potential that this has got. If we can roll it out across the NHS, I truly believe we will make the NHS much safer. As I think Bob Alexander said this morning, you know, healthcare is a risky business and we'll never eliminate all of the risks. But this is using data, it's using technology to intelligently risk manage what we do and get better outcomes for patients. Thanks, Alan. J just, you, you talked a bit about the system. You're leading 
STPs uh, in the northeast. How, how do you think we might take this forward within a sort of system approach to health? Well, I think... Uh, Perhaps you're doing it. Well, uh, no, I don't think we're doing it yet. Um, we, we're helping neighbouring trusts, um, but we haven't got there with them yet. Uh, what I want to do is to create the right environment to encourage other organisations and chief executives because it, the leadership needs to come from the top of the organisation to want to do this. I think if they'd been at this conference in the last two days, the case is made. Mm -hmm. uh, to a degree, I think we're all converted. We, we all want to do this and understand why. But it's about getting that message out. Um, we are talking earlier to Bob Alexander after his session about making sure that NHS improvement do a bit of encouragement to help us with other trusts, get people uh, into the right place, into the right mindset to do this. As an STP lead, I want to have this as a major work stream, which is around the, the safety and quality of services, because part of, uh, the, well, the big ask, one of the big asks for the STP was about sustainability, and linked to that is the quality of the services that we provide and the sustainability of those services. And therefore, um, it is giving us information to, as I think uh, we said it over lunch, intelligently redesign some of the services uh, that we, we currently run to get safer and, and better outcomes for patients. Okay, that, I think that's a very exciting prospect. Um, I remember when I was chairing the National Patient Safety Agency many years ago, we talked about designing safety into buildings. You're talking about designing safety into care systems, aren't you? Yes. And that potentially is hugely important and exciting. Nick, what about Plymouth? What, what news? So, so, so I think, um, and I mean, a lot of my thoughts echo what Alan's already said, but um, I mean, for me, I, well, as an NHS, we're facing, as, as we all know, some of the, some of the biggest challenges uh, in, in its existence. And as we engage with, with frontline clinical staff in terms, whether that's in terms of productivity or whether it's in terms of safety, the first thing you run up against is show me the evidence. Show me, show me the evidence that will take me on this journey with you. So when I think of scan for safety, what we're actually starting to produce, with every scan that we have, we're starting to create huge swathes of smart data so each beep is telling us, you know, who did what to whom, where they did it, when they did it. Um, and as we start to collect millions of those beeps, we start to be able to recognise patterns, we start to look at trends, and we start to be able to talk to clinicians on the front line about real data. And I think, you know, there, there, there's, there's a nice little saying, isn't there? There's evidence-based practice versus practice-based evidence. And, and, and quite a lot of use in this smart data is to take people with you on that journey. Um, they know what they know because they experience it every day. We can actually use their data to take them on a journey that, that, that helps bring improvements, whether that's productivity, whether it's safety, whatever aspect of care it is, but actually take, us, take them with us on that journey. Can you point to success so far? Or are you still on that journey? So I think we're, we're a little bit behind um, Derby by, by a couple of years. So we've rolled out into um, orthopedic theatres uh, and we're absolutely getting that clinical engagement in, in terms of genuine interest in their own data about their own clinical practice and naturally sharing it with one another. We have other areas where we do blood tracking within the hospitals, so we've got um, strict temperature controls on products and we're using the barcoding technology to put in checks and balances within that blood product service. So there's lots of examples of specific some quite specific uh, checks and balances that we can point to. But I think the big, for me, the big prize comes when we start to use the big data to identify patterns and take people with us on that journey. Okay. So, Darby, um, you've been in it um, longer than anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I mean EPCIS, uh, that's a bit of a mouthful. I'm not, I'm not even going to begin to try and uh, <laughs> say back what it stands for. But what, well, what I do know is that what really excites clinical people is, um, you know, is the benefits to patients. And I think that challenge that was laid down by Terence Stevenson yesterday about 
never events and how do you use this technology to, to avoid harm, I think is immensely powerful and I think that's the sort of thing that's really going to engage, you know, clearly people working in healthcare but actually across a health system in, in care as well. And I was struck by Glenn put up the, the stats on the, the latest uh, never events and we know never events, events are the sort of tip of the iceberg. But if you look at that, 79% uh, uh, and then the 12% medication errors with harm, they're all checking errors, they're all errors uh, associated with people kind of checking, you know, which implant, which drug. Um, and one of the things that human beings are notoriously bad at is checking stuff and detail. And I think it was in, it was in the, the film that we watched earlier, but um, I, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that was quoted there was something like um, two-thirds of serious medication errors were checked by a second person. And what that says to me is that second check is basically a bit of a waste of time. So one of the things I'm really interested in is how do you start to get the technology to talk to other systems uh, in the hospital to try and avoid errors? So if you, if you take a really practical example, uh, uh, the, wrong, the wrong lens in cataract surgery is a very common never event. But if you, can, uh, if you can scan the patient, so you know the patient, who the patient is, you can scan the lens, you've got a smart device that can check the electronic patient record and see what's supposed to be going into that patient. And it's a bit like you're getting on the plane, Glenn. If, if all three of those things don't line up, then you know, the lights start flashing and the klaxon starts ringing. So I think you know, getting those really practical applications at that patient level that helps to avoid harm, I think that's the thing that's really, really going to engage uh, uh, our people. Can I ask you, I mean, Derby has been going at this for considerable time now. Um, where is the board of your trust in this? Because, you know, one of the great challenges, I think, for us is, as, as you said, the people here are converted. But there's a hell of a lot of organisations who still need, need to be convinced. Uh, and it will come at a leadership level. And I, I just wondered how your board has been engaged in this and, and kind of, you know, prepare to run with it, invest in it. I think, I, think, I mean, the question for me is, is, is what's caught the board's attention? Right. And, and I was thinking when Kevin, I mean, I, th I think I shared this yesterday, but when Kevin started talking to me about we're doing something really interesting with barcodes, I kind of thought, oh, yeah, really, that's really interesting. Uh, next. Um, but actually, when, when, you, when you start to get senior clinicians like... Uh, like Keith Jones and Bob Goddard, beginning to talk about the clinical benefits, and they're clearly excited by this, then that's when, you know, as a chief executive and indeed as a board, you start to really begin to, I think, put your imagination in gear. You start to think beyond the technology and actually think, well, what are the applications? And I think that's what really captures the imagination of the board. And we've also, we've had the benefit of talks from, from Keith and colleagues, which, you know, you, you can't, fail but to be impressed when you hear some of those uh, some of those practical applications that are being kind of developed you know in in the interests of uh, you know the, the, the why we're here which is uh, you know delivering better patient care Alan getting the board involved and committed yes well you know our board have been involved from the from the start um, I, think I got a question yesterday we we have had our deputy chairman involved in the project um, he was interested so we harnessed that interest, and he's been involved from the start. Um, he'd had previous experience on procurement, but procurement's only a small part of this, as, as we've said previously. It's really about the, the patient safety aspects of it. Um, but he's been working with the trust and working um, with the Department of Health and others to, to ensure um, that he could, you know, try and enthuse... Um, non-executive directors and boards when he, when he goes to talk with them. And we have joint board meetings with our neighboring trusts. So it was good that we had somebody other than the executive in the organization that was promoting, promoting this work, and that's been uh, immensely helpful. Thank you. And in Plymouth, well, I mean, right from the outset, really, we've had absolute buy-in uh, from the board. Right. Probably to the extent of when, when, when Andy came along to the board to, to demonstrate the concept, there was almost too much enthusiasm to go too quick, and actually mm -hmm. the benefits we're trying to deliver aren't enough, and we should be going bigger and bigger and faster. So there was a little bit of management of expectation. We've done development <coughs> sessions with the board where we've actually uh, had the scanners in the room, they've got to play with them, they've got to see the technology in action, and that really takes people with you. And of course, 
people, the way people, we live our lives today, this is technology that they just demand, really. Yeah. So Derby, North Tees, and Plymouth are working together uh, in this subgroup. They're committed to working together. And that brings me, really, to the final question, which is the eternal conundrum for the health service, the not-invented-here syndrome. Um, each of you are developing this slightly different ways. Um, we've got six trusts in our first tranche of development sites. In any case, other trusts have been developing GS1 standards under their own steam. Um, how, how, how do we make sure that, um, not in a soppy way, but there is a collaborative effort here and that we can <coughs> learn from each other? Mm. Um, we're committed to it, but how do we put it in practice? Alan, any, any thoughts on that? Yes, well, in, a, in an era when uh, you know, resources are tight, um, Chancellor's standing up at the moment, don't know if we will get uh, much out of the budget, but essentially it is about working together so that we can do more and, and try to put a bit of pace into this program. Uh, we don't want to be duplicating what each other is doing. Yes, we're implementing the same standard, but our teams have worked well together this far. I think the test for us is making sure that we continue that when the you know, Department of Health funding runs out. We've, we've got to uh, enthuse the rest of the NHS. Um, we can only do that by setting an example which is around working together. And I'm certainly prepared to, to give a commitment that we will, we will work with the, uh, the other trusts as we have been to uh, ensure that the programme develops in the way that it should. Um, and that's how I think uh, we, we, we should you know, move that forward and find the best way of, of rolling the programme out. Nick. So, I mean, certainly in Plymouth, um, we're, we're, we're committed to open standards and we're committed to sharing anything within the NHS at no cost. Um, we have limited specialists in some of these areas doing the work, so it absolutely makes sense that we share that workload across different organisations and we don't duplicate effort. But, uh, I mean, we are absolutely uh, committed to working together. Thank you. Kevin. Well, I think you know, clearly we have been working together, but I think there's a sort of an opportunity almost to kind of renew our vows and have another kind of uh, go at this. And I, and I think um, what really struck me is I think Terence Stevenson really threw down the gauntlet yesterday about Never Events, and it was kind of, well, actually, show us what you can do with, with that. So I think actually that would be a really good kind of, um, you know, thing to sort of focus our, our, our efforts around and to see whether we can, you know, breathe a bit more energy into our partnership and try and uh, see if we can collectively work together to, to meet that challenge. Okay, so I think you've seen a public renewing of vows uh, on stage <laughs> today. Um, you guys come back next year to report on progress, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd just like to thank them because they're really leading the way, putting a lot of effort in, their people are. And look, it's really exciting uh, and I'd just love to be here next year to see what further progress has been made. Thank you so much.